name is Jonathan Murphy, uh, and today <clears throat> we're going to be discussing cardiology, rhythms, symptoms, and their treatments. So just a little bit about me, I'm um, paramedic with Durham County EMS, been there since uh, spring of 2016. I've uh, been in EMS total since uh, about 2010 when I became an EMT and worked in the EMT system for a few years. Uh, before going back to school, I need my bachelor's and then my master's from NC State. <clears throat> I'm also an adjunct professor in EMS from Lake Tech Community College. Uh, I've been there for about a year. Uh, a little bit about me personally. Uh, this is my family. This is my wife, Allie, and my two dogs, Levi in the middle and Rusty. Uh, just to make me feel like a, a student again, so you have a, a good, little bit of a better idea about me. So what to expect in this lecture? <clears throat> so we're going to discover the major pre-hospital cardiac rhythms and their treatments. Um, the major rhythms, we're going to cover the normal sinus rhythm, sinus brady, and within that we're going to cover the heart blocks, uh, sinus tachycardia, the supraventricular tachycardia, VTAC, VFib, AFib, and asystole as well. Uh, within those we'll cover a little bit of pathophys, how they work, why they work, and a little bit of the medications and the treatments that we give for those. <clears throat> a little bit of anatomy, so just like a rough start that'll really help all of us understand um, what I'm saying when I, when I talk about the AV node and the SA node. So this is the SA node here, this is the pacemaker node, this is where all of the cardiac uh, electricity comes from, then flows through the um, AV node, which is this one right here, that you'll see labeled, and then it comes down the, the, the bundle of hiss and the bundle of branches into the Purkinje network. Okay. Um, it's important to note these are the rates per each one. If the electrical current comes from the SA node, you get a rate of about 60 to 100. If you get it from the AV node, 40 to 55, and, and so forth. Um, this will help you understand when we talk about, bundle, uh, talk about heart blocks and we talk about AFib and some of the other rhythms. It will help you understand kind of where the electricity is coming from. <coughs> normal sinus rhythm. So this is a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, looks like this. Rate usually 60, between 60 and 100. P waves present before before every um, QRS complex. You also have a, a T wave that's present. The P waves must be uniform in shape. They must be round. Uh, you have normal PR intervals within the complex itself. So this PR interval is within normal limits. The QRS is narrow, and you have a normal R to T interval, okay, or an S to T interval. That also is important to note that these intervals must be the same between all of the complexes themselves, and these all must be at an even rate. Okay. Um, obviously, there is no treatment for this. This is the gold standard. This is what we hope to see in every patient. Um, if we don't see it, this is what we hope to get back to in every patient. Sinus Brady. Sinus Brady is the same rhythm as normal sinus except slow. Uh, the rate <coughs> below 60 beats per minute. The severity and what you see in a patient is going to be patient dependent. Uh, most don't become symptomatic until a rate below 50. However, it is important to note that some stellar athletes, um, think Lance Armstrong and some other professional athletes, can sit well below 50 at baseline. Um, that doesn't mean that they necessarily have a problem. Uh, their heart has just become conditioned and can work at a lower rate to get the same amount of oxygenation. <coughs> Characteristics are the same as for normal sinus. You have a P wave present before every QRS complex. They're uniform in shape. They're round. Um, you have a normal PR interval. You have a normal QRS interval. You have a normal ST interval. And they're all even with each other. Um, that's important to note with sinus brady. Um, you'll see some differences in the P waves once we start talking about our blocks. So moving a little bit deeper into your bradycardias, we have the first degree heart block. Uh, typically asymptomatic, people live with this, this isn't really something that we deal with that much in the, in the pre-hospital setting, um, not much we can really do about this. Um, this is caused by delay in the conduction of electricity between the SA node and the AV node. If you remember, the SA node sits at the top of the ventricle, or the top of the atria, the AV node sits between the atria and the ventricle. The AV node is providing the energy for the ventricle to contract, the SA node is providing the energy for the atria to contract. So what ends up happening is the atria contracts, and then that delayed response between the atria and the ventricle creates this distance between the P wave and the R wave, or the QRS complex. Okay? It's important to note, usually what we define this as is 0.2 seconds, which is about five small boxes. As you can see here, we have uh, six small boxes roughly between the P wave and the QRS complex. Um, 
often benign, but if we do have the treatment, it typically responds with atropine. Uh, we'll kind of delve deeper into treatments into a later slide. <clears throat> Moving on. So, the second degree heart block. Uh, type 1, there's two types of second degree heart blocks. Type 1 is also known as Winky Bach. It's characterized by an increasing delay of AV conduction until P wave fails to conduct. Now what that means is every P wave gets further and further away until it does not conduct to the AV node at all. Okay, and what that creates is what we call it. What I learned to memorize this as is longer, longer, longer drop. So what we'll see here is we see a long PR interval, a longer PR interval, and then we see a drop. So long, long, and then drop. Okay. Um, and when it said when we say drop, we're talking about the dropping of the AV node conduction. And when the AV node does not conduct, we don't get a QRS complex because the ventricle does not contract. Um, this is typically related to medications or increased vagal tone, not necessarily cardiac electrical issue. Um, this often responds with atropine, but in severe cases, we might need to consider pacing straight off the bat. Um, pacing is typically said to work. Mainly, atropine is typically said to work mainly on lower degree heart blocks. On upper degree heart blocks, are going to need pacing. Um, we'll kind of explain pacing on a later slide as well. Um, second degree heart block type two. So this is the second degree. Um, this is the second type of heart block of second degree heart block. Um, the AV node becomes refractory to conduction on an intermittent basis. Now, what this means is that the AV node is sending that con conduction down at a normal rate every time. But what ends up happening is sometimes that conduction just does not make it to the SA node. And there's really no consistency to this. It doesn't always make sense. As you can see here, we have three complexes before we drop one. Then we have two before we drop one. And then two more and we drop one. What you will notice is all of these P waves have these same intervals okay, until we have a dropped QRS complex. This indicates a significant conduction disease in the His Purkinje system, um, and that is the part of the the part of the system after the AV node, where it separates into the left and right bundle branches, and then comes up and around the ventrals again. Um, often, atropine does not work with this. Often, this will need straight to, to transcutaneous pacing or TCP. A third degree heart block. <coughs> this is a bad day. Uh, it's a complete dissociation from the atrial ventricles. Um, if you remember, we talked about rate earlier. The rate of the atria is within its limits, right? So we see P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, P wave, all consistently, all at the same intervals. So you know your you know your atria are conducting. Um, what we also see is we see QRS complexes, see, and they are also notably slower, right? As we remember, the AV node. Um, is going to conduct at a much slower rate. And when we have a complete dissociation, it means they're not talking at all. Um, this is not going to respond to, to atropine at all. <clears throat> this is going to be treated straight up with pacing. Um, the goal is to get the atria and ventricle talking again so they conduct, so they contract similarly almost at the same time like they're supposed to. Um, and that way we can improve cardiac output. In this situation, if your atria is not pumping blood adequately to your ventricles, your ventricles cannot adequately pump blood to your body. And in that situation, you will have hypoperfusion, which causes um, hypotension, diaphoresis, cool, pale, altered mental status, chest pain, the, the common cardiac things that we would see. <clears throat> now, these are the treatments for sinus bradycardia. <clears throat> Typically, you can fix most of them with a fluid bolus. Um, especially when you're talking about just sinus brady in general and your first degree blocks. Um, if they are symptomatic, the first degree blocks and everything else can also be treated with atropine if they are slightly symptomatic. Um, if they are unstable, we're going to need to go straight to pacing. Um, like anything, consider your reversible causes, go through your other protocols, ensure airway, co airway is patent and breathing is adequate. Okay, And we are going to show you just a quick video of pacing if you don't understand how pacing works. Um, this will take us to a quick hyperlink, and we will get this scene. Hopefully no commercials, uh, but no promises. Commercial.
Let's pause this real quick because it will keep going. Uh, and get back to this. All right. So just kind of explain the pacing. <clears throat> you notice how they mentioned consider sedation in this situation. Um, I'll just let you know. Midazolam is a, is a sedation of choice, at least for us in Durham. The problem with this would be if the blood pressure does not allow you to use Versed. So you, if you don't have a, a pl blood pressure in the 80s, which you will probably not if you're trying to pace them, you can't pace them or you can't sedate them. So typically you're just going to have to pace them, try to get the blood pressure up, and then you can consider sedation. So just a quick summary of the bradycardic rhythms. Uh, we basically covered the main ones. <clears throat> so typically defined as a rate below 50 beats per minute. Um, regardless of the rate, it's important that we consider ABCs and their, their management, just like in any patient. Uh, establish and maintain airway and supplemental oxygen. If possible, get IV access. Um, obviously, if this patient's stable, you should have plenty of time to, main, to get IV access and treat with atropine or any other uses. Um, if not, you might just have to go straight to pacing. Uh, with no IV access and try to get that later. It is a concern. Um, anybody that has this issue, they can decompensate quickly, so try to obtain IV access as quickly as possible. Uh, you need to monitor these patients' status, including their parents and mental status. Uh, the most bradycardic rhythms are asymptomatic. We should be prepared to treat with medications or pacing. Uh, atropine doses 0.5 milligrams every three to five minutes with a max of three. Uh, pacing, you're going to set the rate to 70. In the video, they set it to 80. That's usually protocol dependent, and you're going to increase your voltage until you make, until you get electrical and physical capture. Um, last line of medications in this situation is going to be dopamine and epinephrine. <coughs> These are going to be your pressors. These are going to do some, some a, a variety of things with the heart as well as the vessels to increase your blood pressure and to hopefully improve that as well. Now, um, those are the dosages for those. Those are also typically protocol dependent. So now we're going to move into the tachycardic rhythms. There's a lot more of those. Um, the, the sinus tach is probably the most often seen. Um, AFib is probably the second. Uh, we'll get to that later. Sinus tach is typically the same as normal sinus, but fast. So your rates can be above 100. Severity can be patient dependent, just like with sinus brady. Characteristics are the same as for normal sinus. So you're going to have a P wave for every QRS. You're going to have a T wave. P wave is going to be round and they're going to be equal. They're going to have equal spacing. It's going to be uniform in shape. So it's just like normal sinus except smushed together because uh, it's faster. Uh, the treatments for sinus tach. <clears throat> so the treatments vary. Sinus tach is often not cardiac related. It's often the result of some other physiological issue, exercise, stress, dehydration, pain, anemia, sepsis, COPD, stuff like that. Uh, there's a huge variety of things that can cause sinus tach. Um, typically, the treatments revolve around fixing why they're in sinus tach. Um, if you, if the patient's dehydrated and you're trying to shock sinus tach, it's not going to do that much for you. Vagal maneuvers aren't typically going to work here because this is the heart physiologically trying to increase energy and oxygen transportation for your brain and other and other organs. So, if you decrease the rate here, you're going to effectively decrease the energy and oxygen to those organs and cause other issues as well. So it's important we treat why they're in sinus tech. Um, <clears throat> SVT. So SVT and sinus tech can often be confused. Um, SVT kind of covers a lot of, a, a, a couple of different disease processes. Um, it covers AFib, uh, proxismal PSVT, or PSVT, uh, Wolf Parkinson White, or WPW and A flutter. Um, we will cover AFib and PSVT later on this lecture. Um, the next slide is mainly referring to PSVT. Um, but if you notice in this, you really have no distinction between your P and your, your QRS. You have no distinct P wave. Really tough to find your P's and your T's. You can kind of see them here, um, but really, really tough to find. Um, SVT is abnormally fast. It rises from the upper part of the heart. That's what supraventricular tachycardic means above the ventricles, um, typically designated from sinus tach. Sinus tach usually ma maxes out at about a rate of 150. Uh, SVT, we can see 150 at the 240, even kind of higher than that if we're really kind of pushing it. Um, often difficult to distinguish the causation due to the rate. So if you can't find a P and T wave, they often merge together, so it's often difficult to determine if it's SVT or PSVT. Um, if you don't know, always treat the more lethal, which would be your SVT here. Um, 
often difficult to assess regular regularity because the complexes are so close together because it's so fast. <clears throat> so your treatments for SVT um, are going to consist of vagal maneuvers. Um, that's going to be something like blowing on your thumb or try to uh, try to bear down like you use in the bathroom. Those are some, some maneuvers that we can use that don't require medications or electricity. Um, the second line is going to be a denizen. I'm sure we've all seen videos of that. Not very enjoyable, but they say it is better than getting shot. <clears throat> um, it is important to know that if the patient is known to have WPW, you do not want to administer calcium channel blockers or beta blockers. As you can see down here, um, Ethotizin does make an appearance in this in this treatment here. Um, if they're in SVT and they do not know if they have WPW, it's going to be really hard to dif to differentiate that delta wave in there. Um, but typically, people with WPW will know. Um, if they're unstable, cardiovert, just like with sinus brady, consider sedation. Probably not going to happen. The blood pressure is probably not going to allow you to do that. Um, just a little bit of a, a dis distinguishing between SVT and, S and sinus tac right beside each other, just so you can kind of look at them next door. Um, sinus tac typically begins more slowly, increases, so you'll start a heart rate of 80, then 90, then 110, then 120, then 130, and kind of increases slowly. Um, SVT, you'll see uh, a atrial contraction, and then it'll just kick into SVT and be fast. Um, SVT is typically terminated with vagal maneuvers. Sinus tech, not so much. Um, it's going to be unaffected or very momentarily affected by vagal maneuvers. <clears throat> so our next rhythm that we want to discuss is going to be ventricular tachycardia. Um, it can occur for a lot of reasons. It um, occurs due to coronary artery disease, aortic stenosis, heart attack, electrolyte problems, cardiomyopathy, and it's kind of a long list of things. Um, definition, VTAC is going to be three or more consecutive wide complex QRSs. These are wide complexes. As you can see, these are all wide complex. So in, when we talk about just three or four consecutive, you'll see a normal sinus beat, a normal sinus beat, and then you'll see three or four of these quick wide complex, and then you might go back into that. Um, the longer you're in this rhythm, the more often you're gonna have these wide complex rhythms, or these wide complexes. Um, next, we'll take a look, quick look at a video, which kind of shows you VTAC. Let's see if this works. <clears throat> Let's see. I'll pause this real quick, get it enlarged, and let's try this again. So as I kind of explained in this video, <clears throat> if your ventricles are contracting rapidly, they're not filling adequately, they're not pumping blood to your lungs or to your brain or to your organs, which obviously creates a pretty severe problem. <clears throat> as, you, as you kind of discussed, this quick rhythm will eventually decompensate into what we call AFib, or um, VFib, correct me, um, and that's something that we'll discuss later in the next couple of slides. So, ventricular tachycardia treatments. Um, typically, we're going to consider adenosine in these as well. Um, often, you'll see people go straight to uh, the amio here. Okay, um, it's going to be amio drip right off the bat, 150 and 100 bag um, over 10 minutes, and then you can consider more and more treatment as you go. If amio doesn't work, you can consider lidocaine. Um, I would forewarn in this patient if they are stable now be on your toes because there's a decent chance they're not going to be there for long. Um, these patients should have pads placed on them as quickly as possible, even if you don't plan on using them immediately. Um, but definitely consider 
consider where this is going and this could end up downhill quickly. Um, so you can try the Amio there, <clears throat> but definitely be aware that Cardioversion is probably in the deck and in your hand, um, and you might need to use it here. <clears throat> V-Fib. So V-Fib is the rhythm that they were talking about earlier, um, where VTAC will eventually progress into this. Um, V-Fib does not pump blood at all. all right? So this is the rhythm that you see down here. The heart is just quivering. It's not pumping, it's not contracting at all. No blood is moving out of the heart. No blood is moving to your brain. This is cardiac arrest. Um, this rhythm is fatal. This rhythm will stay here shortly before it gets flatter and flatter until it becomes a systole. <clears throat> so these are the rhythms that we shock. Um, when you put an AED on somebody and it advises if a shock is necessary, the two rhythms that it's looking for are VTAC and VFib. Um, and that is these two rhythms that we have just looked at. The VTAC was the last one, VFib is this one. Um, in this next video, we will watch a heart go from a normal sinus rhythm, um, then it'll go to a sinus tack, and then eventually to VFib towards the end. Um, let's see, it's maybe no commercials, but no promises. Oh. Let's pause this, get a big screen. So you hear, you hear this is the lub dub, lub dub of a normal sinus rhythm. That's what it's supposed to sound like. <clears throat> All right, so now we're getting faster, but we're still lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. So we're we'll getting into a sinus tack here. So now you see we're kind of quivering here. We're not moving much blood at all here. And now we are not moving blood at all. And now we are in asystole. So asystole is defined as a no cardiac, no electrical function. Uh, we'll kind of get a little bit more deeper into that as we move along on these slides. All right, <clears throat> so V-fib. What do we do for V-fib? The only treatment for V-fib is CPR and rapid defibrillation, uh, regardless if that's with an AED on scene or if that is with a monitor that a, a paramedic or a fire truck is carrying. Um, this is one of the big things that they're pushing now is getting AEDs out into the public, teaching CPR classes, teaching people how to get these on. Um, rapid and, and adequate compressions and, and defibrillation of these patients is what will save their life. Um, in the streets, it's important to note um, your, your average response time, you know, we, we, we aim for nine minutes. Um, this patient nine minutes later is probably going to be an asystole or PEA. Uh, so it's important that we get, we train the community, we get the community educated in how to care for these patients and how to keep them alive until we can get there and, and do some other stuff. Um, some life-saving medications, um, your amio as you consider here, your lidocaines, shocking, you know, dual sequential shocking, you know, there's a whole bunch of options that we have that we can give. Um, but like I said, the CPR and the rapid defibrillation is a lifesaver here. Um, sometimes these patients with good CPR and defibrillation will be almost awake by the time the ambulance arrives. Um, <clears throat> next, we're going to cover AFib. As I kind of dis discussed earlier, AFib is probably one of the most seen um, thing, rhythms that we see. Um, when in, the, in the age group above 60, you know, this number gets to be 19, 20, 25% of the populace has AFib. Um, some people live with AFib unmedicated, don't have to worry about it, but they're in AFib, right? The heart rate is irregular. They're not getting, always getting good perfusion. Um, <clears throat> this can, if not controlled, get, get pretty bad. Um, if they're not if their rate is too fast to the point that their ventricles can't receive blood before contracting again, 
they'll become high, they'll get hyper perfused, the blood pressure will drop, heart rate will go up, stuff like that. Um, AFib is really dangerous. You'll see most of these people be treated with something like diltiazem or even metoprolol. Um, and most of them are on a blood thinner. Eloquence is a pretty popular one uh, in the area, at least. AFib increases the rate or the, the possibility of other issues by a pretty rapid chance, right? So it increases your chance of a heart-related death by two times, but it increases your risk of a stroke by five. Um, and the reason that is is because your atria are actually contracting, like they're they're quivering, so blood will actually pull in your atria. And then that clot can break loose and move into your ventricle and be pumped into your systemic system or into your brain. And that's what a stroke is, is when that clot pumps into your brain and cause a stroke. That's why most of them take blood thinners, um, is to, to reduce the, the risk of those clots happening. Um, it's easily noted on EKG by the irregularity of the QRS. So you see here, down here, none of these match up. So you have... You know, you have three boxes between these two, and then you have one, two, three, four and a half boxes between these two. You know, so it just doesn't make any sense, really. And that's because your atria, your SA node, is sending irregular conduction down through the system and causes this. Um, typically, you're not really going to see a P wave. It's going to be real choppy like this. A flutter will be pretty similar here. Um, these waves will just a look, will look a little bit different. They'll actually be kind of sawtooth um, and more regular. Um, this rate, just like anything else, if it gets too fast, can become extremely dangerous extremely quick. Um, and it's important that we do that. It's also important to note that a person in AFib <clears throat> has has a pretty good chance. Um, you got to remember when you when you're treating this to try to bring it down slowly. Bringing it down too fast could cause a clot to break loose, and you could have they could have a stroke or a heart attack. Um, so typically treated first off with a fluid bolus. In my findings, a fluid bolus works most of the time. Um, if the fluid bolus doesn't work, you, the next goal is to tie them. Um, metoprolol is also an option <clears throat> in an effort to reduce polypharmacy, which is the, the taking of, mo of multiple drugs that work a different way. Um, we typically try to match here. Uh, if the patient's already on Diltiazem, we try to go with Diltiazem. If the patient is taking a beta blocker like Metoprolol, uh, we try to go to Metoprolol. Um, we do that, like I said, to reduce polypharmacy and hopefully create less issues down the road. <clears throat> um, so the next thing we're going to look at is we're going to look at a video. It's going to cover cardioversion, which is the the synchronizing and the shocking of the heart in an effort to get the rhythm more controlled and back to where it's supposed to be. As you can see, your jaw, your 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 electricity ranges here, dosages, just like any other medication. Consider sedation, but just like the, the, the previous times, it's a decent chance you're not going to be able to because the blood pressure is just not going to permit it. So, I want to watch this quick video. Next, I want to watch this. <coughs> after this brief commercial.
All right, so that is cardio version for a fib. <coughs> Moving on. So we're going to discuss rapid rhythms. We're going to kind of we kind of discuss most of them. Now we're going to just watch two videos. Um, kind of discover shows you the process of cardioversion as well as defibrillation. I know we just kind of looked at one. We're just going to catch another one, a little bit of a different view, a little bit of a different a different opinion on this process. Um, so we're going to do cardioversion first. Cardioversion is typically for the per person that has a pulse. So this is just going to be the procedure on a mannequin. Alright, so that's cardioversion. Alright, next we're going to take a brief look at defibrillation. <coughs> so, this video covers an internal defibrillator. Um, there's really not that much difference in what we use in an internal. The only ob obvious difference is the internal is below the chest, it's in the patient, it's implanted in surgery, um, and it works at home prior to us needing to be there. So that's, that's our, our electrical treatments for these two rhythms, or these majority rhythms. So now we're just going to go with a summary of our rapid rhythms. Right? So we want to assess for clinical presentation. This assessment is going to include pale diaphragmatic, checking all the vitals, doing everything you can to get everything in line. Um, typically requires a heart rate of 150 beats per minute to qualify for treatment. If they're asymptomatic, the medication of choice is going to be whatever that specific rhythm is uh, based on the cause and the, and, the, and the rhythm itself. Your treatments could change here. Um, if they're unstable, you're almost always going to go straight to shocking, regardless of if it's fast or slow. If you're doing pacing or you're doing defib or cardioversion, if it's, un, if it's unstable, get prepared to use, to, to use electricity. Um, like anything else, ensure adequate oxygenation, include, ensure airway is open, including getting oxygen, fluid bolus, all that stuff, trying to make them as comfortable as possible. If you can sedate, sedate. Um, they do say that getting getting shot, you're getting cardioverted is like getting kicked in the chest by a horse. Uh, so obviously we want to make the patient as, as comfortable as possible during that pretty uncomfortable process. Um, if a patient's stable, get an IV, give them a fluid bolus. 
you know, give them, give them some medications. Try to do this before we get to a really unstable point. If they are stable, my suggestion would be to not let them walk, not let them move, do all the movement for them. Don't don't stress the heart any more than you have to at this point. Um, stable can become unstable very quickly. Um, and it's important that we remember that. <clears throat> As it says here, be prepared for this to compensate to decompensate uh, to un to an unstable rhythm rapidly. If you don't treat it, it definitely will. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, just a little quote down here. I've I've had calls where you know the rhythm's fast. You don't really know what it is. Um, as a as a wise physician at the hospital once told me, if it's fast and you don't know what it is, and they're unstable, shock it. Um, typically, what that'll do is that'll slow the rate down, even if just for a few a few seconds. Uh, hopefully, give you enough time to to discover what the underlying cause is, uh, and then hopefully you can treat it more adequately. Um, obviously, this isn't a, a, a thing we like to do often. We don't like to do one-size-fits-all treatments. Um, but sometimes, just like with antibiotics, you just got to use something. You got to use a broad-spectrum treatment until you have the ability and the means to to get it something more more isolated, more narrowed down. Um, so yes, that's that. Um, the last rhythm, asystole. <clears throat> this is the flat line that you might hear about in pop culture. Um, defined with no electrical or mechanical action being performed by the heart. So you have no electricity, your, AS, your SA node, there's no P waves, your SA node's not sending anything. There's no QRS complexes, your AV node's not sending anything. You're not even getting beats from your bundle of hiss and your Purkinje network at this point. Um, this is death. I mean, this is definition death or cardiac arrest. <clears throat> Once we get to this point, there's not much we can do. Every rhythm that we've discussed will eventually get to this if we don't treat it when we see it and when we can. Um, this is what we want to avoid. This is this is a hard one to come back from. Uh, so the treatments for asystole is <coughs> your basic cardiac arrest treatments. Uh, rapid compressions, just like with everything else. Early and high quality CPR. Uh, there's no defibrillation of this patient, so just compressions, airway management. Um, Epi every you know every three or four minutes based on your protocol, um, and then after we kind of get everything situated, the the one thing that we can do to try to reverse this is is look at our H's and T's, right? Um, H's and T's are going to be the treatments for cardiac arrest. They're really the only thing that we can do after we run out of these. We're kind of run out of options. Um, you know they say you know you give enough epi to somebody with a Sicily, they say that you can make a a, a, a stick a stick move. Um, so we're going to treat the hypovolemia, we're going to reverse it with fluid bolus, 20 milligrams per kilogram IV, hypoxia, um, hypoperfusion of oxygen to the cells, we're going to correct this with oxygen via BVM, um, once we get the resources on scene we'll consider, int consider intubation of this patient. Um, consider acidosis, hydrogen ions build up in the body when the body is unable to ventilate correctly, so anybody with a prolonged downtime could have acidosis as well as anybody that has any other n number of issues. Um, this is also something that you can see in smokers uh, specifically. Um, this can be corrected by adequate ventilations and sodium bicarb. Um, so with the, the blood is acidic, we add a base, we try to even it out a little bit, get the pH even, and hopefully that'll help. Uh, hypo hyperkalemia, um, increased by, it's caused by an increase or decrease of potassium, obviously depending on which one you're looking at. Um, this is something we really want to be aware of when we're treating people in renal failure, so a dialysis patient or kidney transplant patient, higher risk of, of hyperkalemia. Um, so we're going to consider going to treat with a gram of calcium chloride IV. We're also going to treat with 50 milligrams of IV sodium bicarbonate. Um, you want to make sure you do these in opposite lines if possible. The reason we do that is because you put these two together, they'll actually precipitate and basically create salt in their blood veins um, and obviously we don't want to do that so if we can do this through different through different IV access points that's optimal um, we have no treatment for hypo K uh, we don't carry potassium there's not much that we can do for that hypo hyperthermia correct it you know if it's the summer get them out of the parking lot get them into the air conditioning get them out of the car if it's the winter get them out of their wet clothes get them somewhere warm um, warm and cold saline cold and heat packs and the groin and the, the pressure points um, those will all help to get the patient's temperature back to what we consider normal. Um, the T's, 
not much we can do for the T's. Attention pneumothorax, there's really not much field treatment. Uh, we can consider needle decompression. This is mainly going to be seen in traumatic arrests, um, not necessarily cardiac. Um, and then, so we're just going to dart these people and hope we can get that, that fixed. Uh, cardiac tamponade, no treatment, not in the field. Um, we're going to consider supplemental oxygen, rapid transport. Um, the hospital has a couple of treatments they can do for the tension pneumo and the, and the tamponade. Um, chest tubes, um, cardiac synthesis, you know, other options that they have there. Uh, toxins, depending on the toxin, there might be some things we can do. Um, you know, beta blocker overdoses and, you know, TCA overdoses, some, some, some stuff like that we can actually treat in the field. Uh, but the majority of the time, you're going to treat this with a fluid bolus and, uh, and transport if we can't fix it, if we know for sure that's what it is. Um, not much we can do for PE. Uh, if, you think if, you're sus if you're suspect of a PE, supplemental oxygen, bag them, rapid transport to the hospital. The hospital can do thrombolytics, they can do surgery, they can try to get that embolism out of there and hopefully get their respiratory drive back up. Uh, coronary thrombosis, so a heart attack. Like I said, there's no field treatment there is either. Um, supplemental oxygen, rapid transport. <clears throat> Assuming you get, get ROSC, this patient's probably going to go to the cath lab. They're going to get stented. And depending on how well this all goes, they might walk out of there. Um, but just consider supplemental oxygen and rapid transport for that patient. Um, so that, that covers everything. Um, that covers all the most common rhythms that we see in the field. So just keep that in mind. Do what you can to, to kind of correct them. And that'll be that.